Next on Face the State, the fallout from the stunning fall of Congresswoman Elizabeth Esty. New details continue to come in about how she dealt with an abusive aide. Today, we will discuss with Jeff Cohen, the news director of WNPR, also the local president of the National Organization for Women, Cindy Wolf Boynton, plus the newest candidate in the race for governor, Democrat Susan Bicewitz, and our flashback. How Connecticut reacted when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated 50 years ago this week, when Mayor Ann Ucello helped reduce tensions in a city in shock and mourning. It is all straight ahead this Sunday morning, April 8th, 2018. From Eyewitness News, Connecticut's most watched local political program, this is Face the State. Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm Dennis House. How quickly things can change in politics. Just a couple of weeks ago, Congresswoman Elizabeth Esty was highly regarded and breezing toward re-election. This Sunday, she is mired in scandal. With us today, Jeff Cohen. He is the news director of WNPR. And Cindy Wolf Boynton. She is the Connecticut president of the local chapter of the National Organization of Women. We thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. Jeff, I want to get caught up on the news of this week. And sure. you, your office, had a run-in with Elizabeth Esty's office. Tell us what happened. We did. So on Monday, on Tuesday morning, Dennis, we asked for a copy of the severance agreement. This is the agreement mm -hmm. that Congresswoman Esty's office signed with her former chief of staff, Tony, Tony Baker. We asked for a copy of the document. We got a copy of the document in short order from her current chief of staff. Uh, that document spells out a bunch of things, including the consideration that uh, the office would give to him as he left, things like the promise of a letter of recommendation, the waiver of some student loan repayment options, um, some actual payment. Um, and then he promised not to say a whole lot, uh, among other things. Uh, one thing we noticed in that document was that there were unredacted emails. And the congresswoman's email that she had uh, on file in this contract document was a personal Gmail account. She did not learn the Hillary Clinton lesson, obviously, here. Uh, uh, apparently not. And so in that email, um, in, in that document, we posted that document, uh, posting her personal email online also. Part of the notion, part of the story being, uh, here is a, an official contract document where a congresswoman is using her personal Gmail as the point of contact on behalf of the office. Keep in mind that. She herself is not a party to the document. The office is a party to the mm -hmm. document. Um, we post it, we tell that story, we're in the process of telling that story, and then later in the afternoon, uh, in the evening, we get a request to take it down. We think about it, we go back and forth. We didn't think it was necessary to do so at the time. And eventually, after three or four back and forths, we got a, uh, a threat, which was, if you don't take it down, we think the only reason to keep it up is to harass the congresswoman. If you don't take it down, we'll refer this matter to the, to the U.S. Capitol Police. This came from Tim Daly? Tim Daly, her chief of staff, after uh, um, consultation with their lawyer. What, what was the most surprising thing you learned going through this severance agreement? Because I know a lot of us were stunned that his student loans, Tony Baker's student loans, were wiped out. There, what's interesting, and the congresswoman, we interviewed her last Friday, and she said this. She said, um, these documents are not necessarily made for this situation. The Office of House, House Ethics Council um, has these documents to protect Congress people who are in difficult situations with employees. In this case, it's, it, it, it gives a lot of consideration to an employee who did things that were wrong. And what it does is it goes out of her, its way to protect her, the congresswoman, her office, uh, and him to a certain extent. And, and her reasoning for this was he knew my passwords, he had the keys to my apartment, he had my tax returns. Uh, so what was most surprising is that it didn't have any consideration for the victim in the case. Are you surprised by all the access he had to her in terms of the keys to the apartment, the passwords? Is that normal for a chief of staff? So that's not normally my circle of uh, things I know about. From your knowledge, yeah, yeah, exactly. We're all <laughs> learning a lot about how offices work sure, because of this. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me, but uh, I am surprised that on the, out, uh, on the way out, that because of that access, in part, so much care had to go into caring for someone who, is, uh, who has not disputed abuse allegations. Now, the victim in this case, Anna Kane, and you know, we're using her name because she has used it. She's you mm -hmm. know, come out publicly about this. Do we know anything about any kind of package perhaps she got when she left? I don't know anything about that. And that's not, again, this is sort of a, a, a strange circumstance sure. that we're in, in this game to begin with. Uh, but I've not had a chance to, to, to speak with her about that. Cindy, I want to bring you in this. So Anna Kane goes to Congresswoman Elizabeth Esty and says that this 
colleague of hers, her superior actually, uh, punched her, berated her, threatened her life, and yet he continued to work there. What's your reaction to that? That's pretty amazing. A amazing, clearly, in a, in a very bad way. Um, it's, it's, it's really, it's unconscionable. I mean, he was there for three more months. And I know that uh, Congresswoman Esty has certainly said that she handled it badly. Um, but the idea of, of this woman being in the same office with someone who threatened to kill her, it's, it's, it's unimaginable and it's certainly, it's, it's unacceptable. Are you concerned that perhaps other women working in that office might not be protected right now or perhaps in other congressional offices? I, so I, I think that, that this, this quagmire, this, this horrific situation that we're in leads to an examination certainly of what's the bigger picture, what's going on. You know, our leaders, our elected leaders, those are our, our role models, right? Those are the people who we trust to make policy who are going to protect all of us. And I think what we see is a system instead where the policies are meant to protect those elected leaders, but not those who work for them. And, and that's just not right. That's unacceptable. To your earlier point, Dennis, to the notion of what was most surprising, um, this is a man who, uh, uh, the congresswoman knew that there were allegations made against him. Part of their settlement agreement, their severance agreement, was a promise of a favorable job recommendation outside of D.C. As though, as though to give him a job recommendation to a, a position of influence outside of D.C. Uh, doesn't somehow put women mm -hmm. uh, in jeopardy or other people in jeopardy who worked in that environment. Um, that was so surprising. He, he left with the promise of a future. Um, not that she should have denied it to him entirely, but that, I think, is raising a lot of red flags to is, a lot of people. Is this why she's keeping quiet, this non-disclosure agreement that she signed? And, you know, we haven't seen her all week. She's been in hiding, as I know some reporters have referred to it. I don't know. We, she was speaking early. She spoke to us early Friday morning. Uh, we had a nice interview with her uh, where she was able to, to, to flesh things out. I think since she made the decision to not seek re-election, uh, she's, she's made it clear that she's not making public appearances. And so that, I think... That's been, that's been a deliberate move. Jeff, were you surprised by the reaction to this? We had some very prominent people calling for her to resign. Among them, Senator May Flexer, who's been a guest mm -hmm. in this program, Secretary of the State Susan Bicewitz, candidate for governor, who's coming on a little bit later in this program as well, Martin Looney, Bob Duff, and they were the hard for current, your former employer. Yeah, it put a lot of people in a difficult situation for, for a lot of obvious reasons. In fact, the day I spoke with May Flexer, uh, she said, you know, I'm, I'm coming in, this is a state senator, I'm coming in today to the, to the legislature to to push, hopefully, through the Judiciary Committee, uh, a bill on workplace harassment. Uh, how can I, she's, this is her talking to me, how can I come in and advocate that and not take a strong stand? Do you think she SDKs? should remain in office, Cindy? That's a really tough one. I, I, I don't know if she can be effective on Capitol Hill right now. I don't know if she can effectively, effectively uh, represent her constituents right now. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the thing with your head and not with your heart. I think that so many of us are going through right now that this is a congresswoman who has represented us well. I know from now's standpoint, we've endorsed her. She's been a champion for women's issues, but she has done something that, that we just can't fathom. Doesn't she undermine in some ways, though, the, an argument could be made that she undermines the woman's movement by staying in office, having done this? By staying in office, but certainly for the protection that she gave this man who clearly was an abuser, right? He clearly was an abuser. He, he verbally berated her. He threatened her life. Um, and, and we have lived in a culture for so long where it's the abuser who gets everything and it is the victim who gets nothing. And you know, with this Me Too movement, people are, are finally stepping up. Women are finally getting the courage to say, you know what, this happened to me and I'm willing to stand up for myself. But I think that the second part of that to happen is to know that there are gonna be resources that are available to you, that the people who should be your champions are then gonna be your champions and fight for you and protect you. Do you believe she's no longer a champion for women because of what she's done? Oh, Dennis, uh, again, that, that is, I, you know, it's, the easy answer is no, right? That's the easy answer. 
right, because we're a society that put things in black and white. I, 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 I think that there's a little bit more gray in there. I mean, should certainly... Should she have called police right away as soon as she found out about this, do you think? I think that the police should have been involved from the get-go, absolutely. Jeff, politically speaking, this is a dicey road for Democrats because mm -hmm. she's still going to be in office unless she does resign. And her name's known throughout the 5th, and people will be campaigning there, and they're going to say, but what about Elizabeth Estick? Mm -hmm. A dicier road would have been had she not announced this to begin with. You know, uh, Democrats weren't, I don't think, terribly keen uh, to run with her, and I think Republicans probably, I mean, obviously would have been happy to run against a wounded Democrat. Um, the fact that she's not running makes this one of the first really open seats in a long time. It doesn't happen very often, meaning not, no incumbent running for office. Um, I think probably, if you, just from a basic political analysis, it's probably more favorable for Democrats at this point. And there are at least six or seven candidates that there we know of right a now. A bunch of them. Including Dr. William Pettit. Mm -hmm. uh, who else are we hearing? Mary Glassman is another. That's right. Mary Glassman is another. Um, Manny Santos, former mayor of Meriden. Right. And, and this is a year where everyone is sort of taking a step. There's a lot of jockeying happening. There's a lot of open positions. And so it just contributes to that. And for a, for, from a reporter standpoint, this was not a race we were devoting time to. And now we have to. In terms of the Me Too movement, what kind of things will Connecticut now be demanding of candidates, not only in the 5th District, but from gubernatorial candidates, Senate candidates, and so forth? So I think that idea of elected officials being held accountable and you know to use the, to use a cliche to walk the walk and talk the talk right so we had this we have this wonderful bill that's now gotten out of the judiciary committee um, in the general assembly that hopefully will then be voted on and passed that uh, toughens uh, sexual harassment laws in the workplace it extends the amount of time for women who want to come out and you know finally gather the courage to make their claims. Um, you know, it's interesting that, that the policies that we have in the General Assembly right now, um, it, it's hard to tell how exactly our legislators are being held accountable. But I think if those are our leaders, if those are the people who are put in charge of making the policies that are going to protect us, you know, if corporations are, exec are expected to uh, undergo sexual harassment training, right, if leaders in the public sec uh, private sector rather need to do that i think there should be a look at our leaders in the uh public sector going to do that as well cindy will Boynton of the connecticut national organization for women chapter that is and jeff cohen news director of wnpr we thank you so much for your insight and being in the Welcome. program this sunday when we come back we will talk with the newest candidate in the race for governor and you can watch past editions of face the state either on our website, WSB.com, or our brand new YouTube channel. We'll be right back.